I wanted to start our conversation tonight around some of the ideas that actually Caroline had brought up uh, with the design triennial, which as she mentioned, we just announced it in the press today. We're looking and exploring nature in contemporary design. And everyone who is sitting up here, their work touches on nature in some way. Um, so it's something I've been thinking about quite a bit. I think many of us have, and I know each of you have in your own way. And so actually, Anne, I wanted to start with you and ask you what nature means to you in your work. Okay. Well, I distinguish between nature and landscape. So nature is an idea, not a place. A lot of people say, I'm going to go out into nature. But to me, that means they probably are going out into a landscape where the touch of the human hand isn't so obvious. But for me, land, uh, nature as an idea is the physical, chemical, and biological processes that sustain life. And so working with landscape design and planning um, it's important to me to work with both these physical, chemical and biological processes or natural processes as well as social and cultural processes because landscape is a mutual shaping of people in place to express ideas and to create a habitat for us and for the living organisms with which we inhabit the earth. So, um, I don't, does that do, do it? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and I think you actually touched on something which is quite interesting that to many people when they think about the concept of nature, you think about going someplace else, that it's someplace it's not the built environment somehow or the city. I mean, can you comment more on? Oh, interesting, yeah, it should. Right, so uh, I was very frustrated in, uh, as a young uh, professional working in a landscape architecture and planning firm uh, that Ian McCarg was a partner in. Ian McCarg wrote a book called Design with Nature. It was published in 1969. And the frustrating thing to me was we were working on, in the office on projects for ecologically designed resort developments and new towns. And meanwhile, I was living in West Philadelphia and taking the bus every day down into the city mm. and watching the city crumbling. And um, it, it really uh, bothered me that we weren't looking to apply these ideas of ecological planning and design to designing cities and making them more livable, more beautiful, more ecologically sustainable. <laughs> so I decided to write Design with Nature for the City, <laughs> which was my first book, The Granite Garden, Urban Nature and Human Design. So for me, the city is not separate from nature, and I think that is really, it is so ingrained in society to think of city and nature as separate, but natural processes don't stop operating at city limits. <laughs> so if you think of, of nature as uh, processes as opposed to a place, then it opens up all kinds of opportunities for design yeah. and for thinking about how you can design with these ecological processes to create a more resilient, more sustainable, more economical city to build and sustain and more beautiful. I love that idea about nature as processes. There's something that's very powerful and potent about that. And uh, Sunanda, thinking about your work at the Mediated Matter Group, can you talk to that about nature as processes? Is that a way that you approach nature? Yeah, definitely. So I think in our group, we tend to not just think about products, but definitely how processes happen and how you can design with them over time. And talking about what's nature and what's not, one of the questions that comes up with us a lot is what is natural versus synthetic. 
um, because right now we're in the age of synthetic biology. So we are able now to um, edit genomes, edit genes, and then start working with those engineered systems. You can basically design how a living organism interacts with its environment. And that's sort of what I'm working on in particular in our group. Um, and when you're thinking about that tiny level of a, of a bacterium, for example, you can expand the same thinking across scales to how a large scale piece um, a printed piece, a 3D printed piece, for instance, can interact with the environment around it. Mm -hmm. And I just started reading Ian McCard's books, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we were looking at if we're creating something that is biological and large scale in an environment that's changing, of course, all the time, mm -hmm. and it's exposed to sunlight, to wind patterns, things like that, what are all the different pieces of information we need to make this piece of architecture work with the environment around mm -hmm. it? So one of the things we want to do is start looking at environmental DNA mm. and look at the different species that exist there mm. and see if instead of introducing entirely new species, we can take those ones that already exist in the area and engineer them to work in a specific way. So not just looking at GIS data or GPS data or wind patterns, but also what is already living there um, and really looking at sequencing that. Environmental DNA, is that like microbiomes or is that like, what is that? Yeah, it's sort of the microbiome of an area. Yeah. So there's a bunch of different techniques you can do to, to sample soil or water mm -hmm. um, and look at all the different DNA fragments that exist. Mm -hmm. And so you can have an idea of what different species are there mm -hmm. and then hopefully in the future what different enzymes, so mm -hmm. specific patterns of DNA or RNA that you find. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. You know, and. I, I mean, so much of, you know, the work that you guys are doing, for instance, coming out of um, the Mediated Matter group is so interesting. I mean, thinking around materials and systems and ways of building that enable a structure to vary its properties based upon external environmental conditions. I mean, that's something that, you know, I feel very much like we, you know, are, are still living with, you um, you know, these, these principles of modernism, right, and these materials of concrete and steel, and we very much kind of eschewed growth and change in the built environment in a way um, using these materials. So it's interesting thinking about how a material could degrade perhaps <laughs> in response to environmental conditions. I love that, you know, Neri always points out like our skin, for instance, um, can certainly vary its properties. It can become more porous, it can change its melanin content, it can become more stiff you know, all in response to uh, to the environment. And so how could our built environment potentially respond and replicate to some of that? So it's it's exciting. Um, and for you, McKeong, I mean, you know, kind of going back to this idea as well of, of nature and situating it within your work, I mean, what does it mean to you? Um, well, I think, I think people use the word nature and it's, there's a kind of romantic quality to it. It's like this distant dream of um, something. And I think it's a very dangerous position that we've taken that we are, as human beings, not part of the natural system. And I think that's why we find ourselves where we are today. That we are, w when, we, when we see something that's so distant and separated from us, I think we can then do things that we do to the natural world. We can with the environment, we can, and I, I think that that is um, really clear here in the United States, where um, we have these national parks, which are pristine, they're perfect, and we gate them off, and um, and then we, um, when we live in the city, we don't really fully understand a lot of the systems. Um, there are some people who talk about how. The, the kind of little pieces of nature that we have in our backyard, our gardens are the place where we learn about what our place is in the natural world. But I think one, play, one example um, that we found through our practice is that it's where young people play. They understand, I think from a very, very young age, when they're in diapers still, they see um, a dandelion and then it turns into kind of seeds. and. And there's a way in which young children teach us about being in awe of that process. But I, I'm always um, wanting to be very careful about being too, um, I can't think of a better word than romantic, because I think it's, it makes it like a dream, but it's, it's real. You know, and we don't take care of, we're not resilient. An example I can give is we're doing a project in 
a botanic garden in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we showed the client this um, map of, they, they were insisting on, you only want native plant materials. But if you look at a map uh, of showing the plant zones in 2050 and then 2070, it's like completely different, <laughs> you know, and right. I think it's a very, um, for me, it's like this question of like, what is natural? How can we be more um, nurturing to the environment that we live within? And how can we also have a kind of more flexible definition of what that is? Because it's changing at a rapid pace. And um, so it's, it's a very complex question, I think. And nature is a word we don't actually use very often because it's too difficult to, to talk. It's like beauty. It's a very difficult world. Yeah, no, it's, and it's very loaded. I mean, there are certainly traditions that we're coming out of with very much a romantic idea around nature, which I think is, you know, very rooted in, like, 19th century philosophy and theorists. I mean, think about, like, Walden, <laughs> you know, in this very kind of romantic vision of, you know, living in with nature and whatnot that, to a way, it hasn't served us well. Uh, right, I mean, there, there are some horticulturalists who talk about the City Beautiful movement and that it actually has a kind of racist edge because it was defined, um, the kind of beauty and the nature and bringing that into the city was a way of actually pushing out underserved um, populations from the city. And so I think that it's a word that's so loaded because um, some African-American communities look at it with suspicion almost, but in other ways, there's a lot of research which shows that even just one tree or even a painting of nature can make us feel just a little bit better, you know, physiologically, mm -hmm. so it's, it's... Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. I mean, it seems like there certainly is a connection with health. I mean, do you find that in your work? Or you'd, you've done work, like, with the Chicago Hospital. I mean, how does that factor in? It's a huge sea change in the last... Um, uh, there's some people in the audience who I've worked with on a project here in Boston. Uh, I'd say even 10 years ago, there was this real sense with um, these uh, kind of cl clinical environments. Mm -hmm. you know, every square footage, every square foot matters, you know, and there's always this discussion of, um, you know, spend $5 million on a garden, not that we've spent $5 million <laughs> on a garden here, um, but $5 million on a garden, and then how many MRI machines can you purchase for that? You're taking over 5,000 square feet in the city but there's a lot of research out there which, which shows that within three to five minutes, engagement with the natural world actually um, regularizes our heart rate, normalizes our brain function, um, everything in the body. And it's something that we all know intuitively. You walk along the beach and you suddenly, it's something kind of transforms in your body. But it took a lot of, um, uh, kind of psychological research to, to allow for, because there's always a financial impact in the work we do. Uh, you know, how do you make that decision? Um, right, and Anne, for you, I mean, a lot of the work that you're doing in Philadelphia, for instance, right now, you were just mentioning to me before the panel that you're about to begin writing a book, I hope I can say that, um, kind of summarizing the 30 years of the work that you've been doing with this river that's been covered over and whatnot, and I can't help but even think about health in particular within that project. I don't know if that's something that you're dealing with in particular or? Absolutely. Um, I'm, s I'm starting the book uh, a couple hundred years before I entered the scene. So it's, it's important to think of places as if being in the process of becoming. They're, they're, they're not static. And they're being shaped by natural processes and interplay with economic and social and cultural processes. So in order to bring people into this 30-year project and 
reflect myself on what I've learned over that period of time, I found I needed to go back a couple hundred years and talk about the processes that shaped this place over time. That both uh, it was West Philadelphia as an inner city neighborhood. Um, there was a river that flowed through it that drained two thirds of West Philly that was buried in, in, a, in a sewer in the mid 19th century. And uh, over the course of the 20th century, particularly post 1950s, um, it became increasingly segregated racially to the point where it's extremely segregated racially. But people today don't, don't perceive that as having place today having been, it's the result of all of these things that have across time. <laughs> decisions that have been made. I think this, this, this uh, particular microphone doesn't really like me. Um, so there are, how do I back up and say that? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, I discovered in, uh, and, and, and I discovered this river. I'll tell you how I discovered this river. So I was a first year graduate student in landscape architecture. And I went to the supermarket one day and there was a huge hole that stretched for an entire block from building wall to building wall. And I looked down and there was this big brown rushing river. <sighs> and I said, whoa, there are rivers underground. We're walking on rivers and we don't know it. We're literally walking on rivers. And that really, that was in West Philly uh, where I'm now working. So I, I came back when I went to Penn to start working at uh, teaching at Penn. I took up the study of this buried river and uh, noticed that there was a high correlation in low income neighborhoods between vacant land in the buried floodplain, the buried valley bottoms of this, uh, of this river. So there's an association, which I'm telling the story in my book, there's an association between low income people, and particularly low income people of, pro of, pro of um, color, and these buried valley bottoms, which have a higher water table, which if you go into the basements, there are, there's, there's mold in the basements, so you have these associated health issues. Um, and for the past 30 years, I've been working with various people in these neighborhoods to study um, how it developed over time and to develop ideas about how to uh, rebuild the neighborhoods and the vacant lands that exist in these neighborhoods while um, addressing, restoring the, the urban natural environment, um, like the uh, water quality that's uh, the, the city's rivers are polluted by combined sewer overflows. So I've made some proposals about how to um, detain stormwater on these low-lying vacant lands in order to reduce combined sewer overflows and rebuild communities at the same time. But, but it's, and, and this has resulted in policy changes in Philadelphia with uh, their adoption of green infrastructure to deal with their combined sewer overflow problem. But this, this, I found that over the 30 years, this issue of people separating city and nature has been an obstacle to get through to persuade people to take these, this approach to uh, ecological design in the city and to solve multiple challenges with single solutions. Right. And I think that idea, again, of like a process, of place being something that's constantly becoming. And I, I love the idea that you're your starting point for your book is in that moment when you saw this rushing river under the street. You know, it's looking back 100, 200 years, you know, that ultimately there are all these incremental decisions and choices that are made along the way, which end up resulting in the current state of things. Well, actually, it does start with me looking down into the <laughs> And then everyone, my readers, go down into the wormhole <laughs> and travel back in time <laughs> to discover a man named John Guy who was an African-American dump master who was charged with filling in, uh, superintending the fill to fill in uh, the valley bottom after the sewer had been buried. And 
so that brings race and race and river together. I hope that's going to be a part of your book. Good. <laughs> well, you know, there's um, uh, just connecting with that. There's a project that we're working on in Richmond, which is um, the Lumpkin Jail, and it is was one of the um, primary locations where. Um, African slaves, uh, abducted African slaves were uh, detained and sold. And they, f they have the foundation. And so they found that actually the slaves were detained in the lowest part, in the Chaco um, Valley region. And so when they were they just projecting the like 20 year, 50 year storm, they were in these prisons, but they were also, the water level was kind of a chest high. and then people who were running this system were <laughs> I think I mean it just keeps <laughs> I know okay Mary's just telling me I've, I've spoken long enough <laughs> but I do think like there maybe there is a common interest that we hold in the the relationship the cultural relationship with the natural world and that that the separation or the romanticism of that has led us to where we are today. Um, another interesting story that we just read about last month is when African women were abducted in Africa, in South Africa, and they were brought here, they actually um, hid seeds in their hair um, so that they could prepare to grow rice when they came here to, to Virginia. And so there's a, there's like a very powerful narrative that all plants have and all systems have. And I'm fascinated by that. I love that. Um, you know, and Sumanda, what do you think about this idea of, you know, the, the separation of, you know, the human and the natural world? How do we bring that together? How does design work to bring that together? Yeah, I think, hmm, okay, I think right now I've been focusing a lot on not the human because so much of nature is not human or not human shaped. So I think it is really interesting to think about social dynamics and all the things that humans have created in human history. But um, I've been sort of stuck in this place right now of thinking about Earth history, so billions of years. And humans have just come in the last sort of second of that. Um, and there's so many things that, um, talking about what you're saying about, uh, you know, even how seeds travel from continent to continent that are really interesting to see. And humans are definitely impacting the environment really fast. Um, and that's something to be aware of. And I think that's where design starts to come in. So in the, in the work that we're doing right now, we take a lot of inspiration from what's been happening over the last hundreds or thousands or even millions of years. Um, and then see what does that mean in the context of design today? So we're doing a project right now looking at natural uh, pigments, so like melanin, for instance. And melanin has existed for millions and millions of years. Um, and it's been found in you know, squid ink sacks from the Jurassic period, for instance. And it's the exact same chemical structure that exists today in squid ink sacks. And melanin is so um, related to personal identity and racial identity and things like that, um, that sometimes it's easy to think about it as a human thing. But really, it exists in all the kingdoms of life. So I think when I think about issues like this, I take a step back away from the human, away from our species, our kingdom, our everything and then see what unites across all of biodiversity and how can we think to of design looking across biodiversity. Hmm. I love that. It's so interesting. I'm very excited for this project. <laughs> I, oh, nice. Well, I look forward to reading slash seeing what comes out of your thesis. Um, you know, and thinking of this idea of biodiversity and whatnot, I mean, of course, I think all of us were perhaps unsurprised but a bit jarred by the IPCC report that just came out in October telling us that, you know, in 20 years' time or so, there could potentially be very um, systemic and catastrophic changes to the world as we know it. Um, so thinking about this idea of, of climate change, where does design fit into this? <laughs> And I'm going to leave that open to any of you. Uh, you know, I mean, what is design's role within where, you know, where we find ourselves currently? I think design has a capacity to teach us to be better stewards of the environment. We haven't been very good. And um, that catastrophic thing is actually happening now. You know, it's just so incremental that we don't notice it. It's sort of like 
you know, um, I look in the mirror and I, every day, and I don't notice the new wrinkles that show up on my face as I age. And I, I, I kind of equate that with the environment that we slowly accept these um, unbelievable things that are happening to the environment because they are happening so slowly. And, you know, I really believe, although I think there it's important to have a kind of big vision and big plans, but that um, a lot of cities are doing this now. They are legislating ways of integrating at the more granular level, um, ways of, of kind of trying to rectify some of the some of the resiliency issues that we have not been paying attention to. And so it's, um, this is like block by block, <laughs> every project to try to um, understand where is water coming from, how does the wind move through the site. And, and then I think tying that, not separating that investigation and that design strategy from people, but understanding, kind of teaching people, not only are you a part of the environment, are you responsible for taking care of the environment, but you are part of this whole system. And but there's an integration. Yeah, but you have to tell it as a story. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It can't be an academic thing. Or, you know, I was just reading, because <laughs> I used to be a musician, and I was trying to figure out, um, I was just reading some medical papers about this. I, might blow your mind, which is that sound, and you probably already know this, <laughs> sound does not exist except in your brain. It's just molecules moving around, and it's not until it enters your brain that it becomes, those sound waves become meaningful, and it's not even just entering your brain. It has to get to this part of your brain called the amygdala. It's like, <laughs> and going around, and, and I feel like our job as landscape architects is to not just teach people, because that doesn't get into the amygdala. <laughs> it's kind of making meaningful connections, and that, that's what design has the capacity to do. At all levels, I mean, Christina Kim, who is not here tonight because she's in LA, but she is a person who understands the natural processes, and her work, uh, even though it's fashion design, kind of connects us with her, with the, with our bodies, with the natural world, and then with the people who make the clothing. And I, you know, I just think it's so wonderful that there are three, wi four women yeah. <laughs> sitting here. And I think that that is, um, if we can say anything, I think women are m capable of think doing three things at once. <laughs> <laughs> We're constantly doing that. I think um, design has a lot to offer yeah. in terms of mitigation and adaptation to climate change. But one of the big challenges is making adaptation and mitigation to climate change pleasurable. Right, right. Because I think just putting on a hair shirt is not, you know, it's not gonna get everybody's buy-in. But designers should really put their minds to um, what you were just talking about, about making these natural processes that, and, and social and cultural processes that contri contribute to climate change tangible. And then also to uh, find ways on all levels from product design to landscape architecture, architecture, all the various different design fields have their own contribution to um, making the public aware of climate change and and action being action oriented but also making it pleasurable <laughs> i love that idea of pleasure you know and 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 kind of picking up on a bit of even what both of you were talking about you know of, of all these different design disciplines and us as humans really you know integrating and being a part of it i keep thinking and coming back to even this idea of collaboration you know of course it's collaboration with one another and it's collaboration with nature and that obviously you know we're all a part of this and we're all in it together <laughs> um how does collaboration for instance work with you guys at mediated matter um you know, within your practice, you know, thinking about approaching some of these really salient issues. Yeah, I think we, so we think about collaboration all the time, every single day. Um, and also what Nariel always calls productive tension. Mm. 
So in our group, we're like the rest of our department, we're very interdisciplinary. So my background personally is in biology, if you couldn't tell, um, <laughs> and neuroscience. And um, I joined Neri's group as the first biologist there. But before then, there were mechanical engineers, computer scientists, and computational designers, um, product designers, and architects. So already there was quite a large array of people of different backgrounds. Um, and I think every single project we do, we try to figure out every single aspect of it. So that there needs to be novelty or some sort of complexity coming from biology, from mechanical engineering, from design. But I think design is generally the umbrella under which we think of everything else. And so I wasn't trained as a designer, so I'm sort of learning as I go over the last four years. But one thing that I've noticed that design really has to offer in terms of making change, not just for climate change, but also to address many, many other issues, is designers seem to be very good at making frameworks and synthesizing things. So you can put on different hats and you can see where paths are going and where they intersect. And without committing to only one type of technique, technology, approach, or mindset, you can sort of move in between, recruit people from different fields, and start to work to a common design goal. So I've seen a lot of how design can really make people come together and make people come together to address complexity in a lot of ways. So I want to take a step back for a moment. Anne shared with us that fantastic story of you seeing the river that kind of seeded this whole project now that you've dedicated yourself to for 30 years or so. And Mikhail, you mentioned that you used to be a musician. So wh where was the spark for landscape architecture? Does music play a part in any of this? Yeah, I, th I think... Um it's really, I mean, there's the obvious connection between music and, and, and designing the environment where um, music is an immersive experience. It's, you can, it's, um, I think I entered design thinking about um, it, design in a different way um, because in music you can close your eyes and enjoy the music more. Um, when I was in design school, which was a long time ago, um, visual visualization and it, I think it still is it was so important but in landscape it's a multi-sensory experience you smell things it's a constantly evolving experience um, I think one of the things that we do when we teach we try to teach through pleasure or what is to redefine what beauty means in the natural world in the landscapes that surround us whether it's an urban plaza it's a um, university quadrangle or it's uh, botanic gardens, we um, still battle a little bit of this kind of um, picturesque notion of beauty in the landscape, which is so, um, and then we also um, have a very old fashioned view of what landscape architecture should be today. And I would say it, it frustrates me a little bit because if architects were still um, holding up uh, other historical architects from the early 20th century, as we do with Frederick Wall Olmsted, we would just <laughs> kind of look, look askance at them. And so I think there is this kind of resistance to looking forward. But in our landscapes, we try to teach our clients the importance of process so that um, the tree starts small and then it grows larger. It doesn't start large or that grass is turned brown in the winter and some things actually die and don't come back or we design playgrounds that degrade and don't come back. And, and just, I think that's an important lesson about our, our own bodies, uh, the environment, the, nat na the natural world is that it's not permanent. It's not that I, I think this new notion of beauty is the imperfection itself. And we all learn that as we get older, <laughs> that it's not that kind of perfection that, that makes the beauty, but it's the complexity, as you had said earlier. Yeah. You know, there's, oh God, there's so much that you just said that I wanted <laughs> to, I know, I'm like, how do I pick one? I mean, you know, uh, for one, and I, I think just, you know, coming off the heels of uh, this exhibition that I'd worked on, thinking about sensory design and, and multi-sensory experience, I mean, it's interesting even when you just mentioned that and thinking about being out in the landscape, immediately I sort of close my eyes. Because <laughs> there is something that, I, it, we live in such an ocular-centric world that everything is so 
everything is so based on the visual, you know, and we have our social media feeds and we're constantly snacking on images and, you know, and whatnot, but there is something that is so ultimately human about our senses and particularly about being, I hate to say it, out in nature, but uh, honestly anywhere, you know, of being aware of sounds and smells and, uh, and whatnot. And, you know, and I think that all of that is a part of what we potentially experience as beautiful. Um, I think beauty is incredibly important within all of this work as even an entry point. I mean, when you talk, Anne, about this need to make mitigation and adaptation pleasurable, for instance, um, there's something about beauty enabling that, I at least providing an entry point into some of that. I think often about a lot of the work that the Mediated Matter group is doing, and oh my God, I mean, so much of what you guys put out is unbelievably beautiful. So I mean, immediately you're drawn to it, but then all of a sudden it opens up all of these other ideas, <laughs> which is what's fascinating. Um, so I don't really have a question. I'm just well, sort of. I, <laughs> I think that's a really good point because there are some, in landscape architecture, we, we walk this fine line. And I remember um, there's a landscape architect uh, who slipped my name, uh, slipped my mind. Um, but he said to me when I was much younger, he said, as a landscape architect, you have to choose if you're going to be a human or you're going to try to be like God. You're going to try to make nature and you'll never win. But I think, um, you know, it's the natural world is everywhere around us. And um, it's, um, I think that the idea of uh, beauty is another word. It's like, takes, it would take us like three weeks to, to unpack that word, but it's, it's, it's what designers do. They bring this kind of tapestry, the, um, and I think it, when you work in the civic realm, it br bringing the resiliency, the, um, the cultural, the social, you know, our social infrastructure is crumbling in America. We're not connecting with each other. And I don't, I think that they're all interconnected. You can heal the environment, you can heal people's minds, and then you can actually get people, strangers, to start talking to each other all in one. That's what design is. Yeah. It, it's that layered approach. Yeah, yeah, of conversation, of dialogue, of framing, of synthesizing ideas. Oftentimes I even think of design as an interface or as a bridge of, you know, with very complicated ideas, let's say, and translating revolutions that are happening in, you know, the scientific realm or whatnot, and they make a much, you know, they make all of it much more approachable for us. Um, but taking a step back, sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah. I mean, just related to that. Yeah. Okay, our mics. Here. <laughs> yeah, related to that, I just wanted to say that there is a certain amount of urgency that I, I feel when designers speak, and listening to all of you, really, there's sort of the, um, there's a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. and urgency that some change needs to be made and designers will be part of that solution yeah. or be part of the change in some way. And I find that super admirable because um, a lot of the work that is done in different realms of science or engineering even are, are kept within labs or within certain environments and they don't necessarily get out. Yeah. And a lot of what I've seen designers do um, is bringing things that are being, de being made now uh, different revolutions that are happening and bringing them into the rest of the public uh, context. And so that starts to really shape what happens in the future. And I, yeah, I was agreeing also with the, the idea of pleasure and beauty as well. Yeah. I think in a lot of the videos that you, that you see of our work, there's things like cells growing or there's a plate changing color. And a lot of these, a biologist would look at and be like, well, that looks really weird. But then you tell them what it is, and it's a simple blue-white screen or something like that. So it's something that biologists do every day, but a designer looking at it made it look something totally different. And it made people want to engage with it and learn more about it and start to think about it as something that can actually be a tool. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is cannot be understated how important that is. Yeah. And that's interesting too, I mean, for you as a trained biologist and neuroscientist, I mean, coming into this space and now thinking about design so much more, um, you know, I really, I think that so much of it really even, I'm constantly reminded of, of E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience, which is this idea of kind of this integration of, of 
disciplines, if you will, and I really feel like we're beginning to even see some of this consilience between like biology and design and engineering and you know things really are coming together um, and are you know they're no longer things that are existing in these silos. That's right. I think that that the research that's being done is so important because it gives us both the information we need to do our work more effectively, but it also um, empowers the design right. because it. You know, a lot of the people that who are our clients, um, you know, they're, it's a financial decision for them many times. That's the foundation of how they make decisions. And when there's scientific information that tells us about how our neurological systems are working and how it's actually strengthened by something that we've done in the design and that's kind of proven through research, that supports what we do and what we can do and expands our the way we can empower people. Yeah. And even, Anne, touching on something that you mentioned, of, uh, and this was in our earlier conversation, of even thinking of design almost as a research process, you know, thinking of it as kind of a form of research. Can you talk about that a little bit for you and your practice? And you can use my mic. <laughs> Um, yeah, for, for me, design is a, a form of research. I do what I call action research, which is, um, and it's important to say that I don't just test ideas in practice, I generate ideas mm. through practice, mm. Mm. because it's uh, through design practice. Mm. So uh, d design is a, is a verb as well as a noun, and, and um, it's, uh, yeah, I can't imagine, I'm not an armchair theorist. I can't imagine, uh, my, my, my work uh, in practice drives what I write about. Uh, the five years I spent in practice before I started teaching um, really sh has shaped the kinds of research questions I ask. Mm. Because the, the work I'm, that I do, the research I do and the writing I do are to, um, facilitate to, to, to make it easier for practitioners to practice, but also to reach the general public mm -hmm. about what's possible through, uh, through design. Yeah. And I love that idea of, of, of generating ideas through design, and design as being a verb. There's something very active. Oh, that's really important because it's, uh, I, I think that a lot of theorists don't think of design is generating ideas. It's, uh, and putting yourself, it's more like, well, for me, West Philadelphia and my work in West Philadelphia has been a laboratory, for sure. Um, I hope that I've made the place better as a result of my work and my research there, too. Yeah. Uh, but it is a laboratory, yeah. and I am testing ideas, but I find that um, more times the majority of time, it's the generation of ideas. It's not just the testing. I may start out by wanting to test some ideas through practice, and then I discover something even more interesting than whatever it was I set out to, to yeah. test. You, yeah. I mean, d Nixon, do you, do you do that in your practice? I mean, do you find uh, that ideas are generated through your practice? Yeah, I mean, I when I first um, started my practice, I... I was able to do that financially because I got a teaching job. And so there was a kind of blurring of those. I was living in Providence. I had a little garage studio. Students would come over and do things. And so I think our practice was built on that, um, kind of a studio model. And so um, I've always called our practice a kind of multifaceted collaborative, but it's, it, it's um, we're, sh put to shame by the kind of range, but we do have architects, graphic designers, industrial designers, and landscape architects in our practice, and we do believe in the, this kind of smaller pool, that that creates more innovative results because people, we, we argue a lot, and it's a, it's a kind of like, it's not, we're working with somebody who I won't, I probably shouldn't say this in public, but <laughs> it's really on the back of my mind, who's, you know, has a very top-down 
structure to their office, and it's so strange to me that you know, everyone's like, yes, 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 that's right, to this one person. And to me, that feels so dangerous because um, I don't know if one person can innovate for 50, 60 years, and I certainly don't know <laughs> if I can. But, um, I, you know, I think that it is this kind of intertwining. I, I, it is a dangerous place when academics, the, the kind of pursuit of ideas and the pursuit of making real places are so separated. I, I, they should be the same because in the sciences and and um, medical practices, they would never separate those things. And so I see them coming closer together. I see the most interesting designers actually um, through their work, um, they're not necessarily writing white papers, but they are through their work, research and post-occupancy report, uh, reports, understanding how to make the world a better place to live. Yeah. Well, I, I saw in, um, when I was in, uh, in graduate school that Ian LeCard's, he was the chairman of the department, right. but he also had a firm. And that I later came to appreciate when I started working in the firm how ideas were, were explored in the studios at the school and courses and then taken and put into practice and, and worked on further in the office. And there are firms that many of them National Design Award winners, where the principals are both, uh, they're academic mm. practitioners. Yeah. So they are both, um, they're both teaching, yeah. and, they're, and, and there's an intimate connection between their teaching and what they're doing in the, o and the ideas that they're exploring in the office, because the teaching, it allows them to explore ideas yeah. that it, you're just too constrained in a practice. So when I left practice and decided to start teaching, I wrote my first book, The Granite Garden, um, Urban Nature and Human Design, uh, inspired by McCard's book, Design with Nature, which generated a practice for him. Mm. So he already had his practice. Mm. And some of the chapters in the book take work that was being done in the office as part of the, but some of the chapters are studio projects that were being done in the school. And when he published that book, he opened up a whole new wor world of practice for himself and had clients coming who wanted, who were pre-selecting themselves to come to him and say, I, wanna, I, I, I want ecological design. You know, I want to do design with me, uh, developers, he said. I, I want to do, well, you just developed a book on it. I uh, <laughs> said, <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to build an... <laughs> A new town that's uh, that will grow up in this in this woodlands and and be an ecological city. So, when I started, when I wrote the Granite Garden, I was thinking of how to write a book that would create a clientele who wanted to hire me to do the kind of work I wanted to do, which was to design to do urban ecological design, and. I had to decide, uh, I wrote the book while I was started as a young assistant professor, and when it came out, it was reviewed in the New York Times book review, and people started saying, so, do you have a practice? <laughs> and I had to make a decision about whether to open an office yeah. or, um, or not. Yeah. And uh, I decided that I could that I, I wanted to pursue an academically based practice where my salary at the university would support the kinds of projects I wanted to do where I, I didn't have to find a client to support yeah. those projects. So my teaching, my research uh, is, was very much practice based as well as uh, theoretically based. But there are a number, I mean, I, I just, you can just go down the list of so many firms that are really mm -hmm. academic practices where they're, they're teacher practitioners. They may not have time to also write, yeah. but there's this generative uh, energy that goes between the university and the continual meeting and 
dialogue with young people and their ideas. I remember Lori Owen told me once, is Lori Owen a National Design Award winner? She should yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Lori Owen told me once uh, that when he taught, uh, uh, posed a, a problem in, for a studio class, that he already knew there were the A solutions, the B, and I don't mean A, B, like A is better than B, but as different. So there's the A type solution, there's the B type solution, there's a C type solution, and then there's the X, which comes out of, you know, <laughs> somewhere out of some student's mind, which is totally different than anything that he could have imagined. And that this was really kept him on his toes and regenerated him and he'd go back into the office and you know, take these ideas with him. So keeping us on our toes, I want to throw it out to our audience members. Does anyone have a question for our panelists this evening? Yep, we have a question over here. Hi, Anne. Hi, Mick Young. Thanks for sharing. Um, in terms of urban design, uh, this kind of area, so uh, Kevin Hetherington, uh, his article talking about the rhythm and noise, he views that the city is an archi archive. So the derelict uh, of the city is kind of the city with rhythm, and it is encouraged people to visit the derelict of the cities. So I want to know how uh, your view about the derelict of the cities, and if there is a, if there is a derelict, will you change it in how you evaluate uh, the value of it. Thanks. So do you, yes. do you mean derelict? Yeah, or? derelict. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll answer the first, I'll speak to the first part of your question, which is about the soundscape of the city, which I think is extraordinarily important. And there is a man named Murray Schaefer who wrote a book called The Tuning of the World that was first published in, I think it was the early 80s. And he then went on to found a soundscape institute and studied the soundscape of various cities. It's r is really important work. And there's an ecological, acoustical ecology association. So uh, I, I had an experience once in Paris in Parc de la Valette where they had the sound installation and I was walking through the park. I absolutely agree with you that the city is an archive of sound, no question. Um, it's an archive, period, uh, but certainly of sound. And I was walking through these sound ins various sound installations, and then I got to this one part of the park, and I heard birds chirping. So I looked around. I didn't see any birds. And I realized there were speakers in the shrubs <laughs> that were projecting this, the sounds of birds. And I kept walking down the path, and I noticed that there were these, these speakers that were like triangular, so that it came, you got the sound from in front, and then as you pass by, you got it coming from back. Okay, we got down in this place. We've got it down now. Uh, we sat down in this place. I sat down in this place, and, and I was listening, and I realized I couldn't distinguish between what I was hearing from the speakers and what I was hearing from the environment around me. And Parc de la Valette is right by the Boulevard Peripherique, which is the belt highway that goes around Paris. And so there was the sound of trucks and cars and nearby. And But my ear got tuned in listening. I must have sat there for about 15 minutes. Then I got up and left. And I walked out of the park into the city, and I heard the city in an entirely different way. The soundscape within the park, the sound installation, had tuned my ear. And I began to hear the city, the bass rhythm of that neighborhood. And then I began to hear the syncopation. And then I began to hear other melodies coming in and out. Uh, they're not really melody, but they were whatever you could call them. I don't know. I'm not a musician. But it lasted for about a day, and then it dissipated. But I've always wanted to get it back. I don't, I don't know <laughs> quite how to, how to get back that tuning that occurred as the result of this, of this, 
design of the sound installation in this park. And I think this is the kind of thing that also Mick Ring was talking about earlier, about the, the power of design to heighten our sense of the perception of our senses, to hear and see things that were otherwise invisible or inaudible to us. And through design, one can, can, can really tap into the potential for human, pote for human perception that we don't, we don't have ordinarily. So anyways, that wasn't about derelict. Maybe <laughs> somebody else can pick up about the derelict. I, I don't really know how to answer your question either. So <laughs> but I do, it, it, I don't know if it's connected. Somehow in my brain it feels somewhat connected that my son is a music composer. He's studying to do that. Um, so he's really, it's very abstract. And um, he showed me the difference between sounds that surround us now, which are pretty much digitized, and when you actually see what they look like, they're actually digital, digitized images because they simplify the sound waves. Whereas sounds that come from directly from an instrument or from my voice coming to yours, and they are actually these curved shapes. And I would love to have somebody do a study to see how that's affecting our bodies and our, our minds that we're more and more of the sounds that we hear in the city are these kind of stepped shaped sounds when you visualize it versus the sounds that that may be coming from nature or are more direct connections to each other that are actually, you know, I, I didn't believe it when I saw it and I told my son, let's zoom in a little bit more to that curved, those curved shapes, but there is a difference that there's this kind of simplification of sound in the city, um, which is probably different. I mean, I don't know if you know the composer John Cage. Um, and so since him, there are all these other um, young composers nowadays. If you're interested in learning, um, look at who's won the Rome Prize in music composition in the last four or five years, and you'll see they're also crossing a lot of boundaries, but they're interested in, in some of the questions you've asked and probably would be able to answer it a little bit, bit better than me. Any other questions? Yep. I'm wondering um, if uh, any of the panelists would be able to talk about uh, a negotiation have been uh, talking about. Um, so yeah, just this, this dynamic, whether it's a project or, a, or an idea. So could you ex expand on that a little bit? You, the, the, the historical landscapes? Sure. So um, whether it's, um, say, a historic landscape that was designed by a significant uh, designer or, or for a specific um, event that occurred in this place or a group of people that, that occupied this place, uh, whatever it may be, versus the tension of um, needing to accommodate Well, a, a Danish colleague of mine, Svenning Var Andersen, has written a very interesting article about this. And if you go to a website, marnasgarden.com, and uh, one of the, on, on the website, there I, I have a, s a, f a bunch of publications that he wrote that have been translated into English. And one of them is on preservation, where he distinguishes between many different, several different kinds of approaches to dealing with historical landscapes. One is um, reconstruction, where you try to, I, I'm not gonna get it exactly right, but <laughs> where the idea is that it's, it's an exact reconstruction. And there's not much room for design because he says this is the task of the technician, <laughs> you know, the historic preservationist technician. Um, the next is restoration, where he says design begins to come in to play. And he's got one more, and then the final uh, one is what he calls free renewal, where there's, uh, it may be a new place within a historical landscape 
where the designer works within the spirit mm -hmm. of the original, but with a sense of freedom and renewal and in dialogue with contemporary design. But it's a really, it's, I didn't do justice to his article. I would, I highly recommend it. You know, I think well, all, landscape, for preservation. all landscapes are historical. And so our work is about uncovering that history and interpreting it and abstracting it. And that, that's another level of education we want to teach people. I think that's a whole other kind of um, panel, but it's, I think the more we know about history, the more our politicians would know about history the better off we would be. And histories like ecology, it's not fixed, right? It's a constantly evolving moment. It's very artificial when you learn history. Um, you know, and this year, I just think how long a year is even, or this month or a day, right? So it has a kind of artificial slice to it. Um, and I, we always try to think of our work as kind of uncovering current uh, current cultural conditions and how it relates to the history of the place because there's always a connection. Um, but I don't believe that, w I, I do believe that you look forward, you know, that, that creativity is about understanding what that means to look forward. Um, that, and that always is about honoring the, the place and, and where it was before. Yeah. yeah, just to underscore that, the landscape architect Ian McCard said, every place is in the process of becoming. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, that is actually, that is a great way to end. <laughs> uh, so uh, if we have one more question, we do have time for one final question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question to the panelists about in practice of landscape, uh, handcraft plays an important role and uh, computer techniques plays another important role. Uh, if we look at the picture of 50 years ago when architects and landscape architects work, they draw the drawings by hand, they build clay models, but nowadays people will like to see the, the fancy digital renderings, uh, cool digital modelings. That's the tendency of the techniques. So I want to hear your visions about in the future, uh, in the practice of design, what kind of a role a uh, handcraft versus uh, computer technique? I think it's both. I think young people have a tall challenge in front of them because you have to learn both. Um, it's a kind of intertwining and learning which tools are most effective for what because digital, digital technology is still not good enough in certain things. They're, the kind of manual um, technology still trumps digital technology, but I love digital technology. It lets us build in ways that we never could build before. And it also, coming from music to design, I think I just learned last year how to make that translation a little clearer in my mind. Because when you play music, you are making decisions live. You know, you're playing the note, you can change it as you're performing it. And in design, it's often, you know, there's like six degrees of separation till you've actually gotten the project built. And um, there is something very nice about Rhino Grasshopper technology is that we actually send that file directly. We bypass a lot of middle people, middlemen, and um, we're able to actually get as close, it's like playing music is as close to the material and the, the fundamentals of making it. And so I think eventually those two technologies will come together, but I don't see why it has to be an either or. You know, I think they're both amazing and there's a way that they can interface with each other, or at least that's what we, what we do. Yeah, I can attest to that in school right now. Right. Um, right now. We're definitely doing both. And there's the added challenge of, or added opportunity rather, of um, when you find a technology that isn't working the way you want it to work, you can write something new. Um, and especially at MIT, I mean, you obviously know this, um, there's a lot of opportunity to have the freedom to do that and all the tools are available. So um, some of what we're doing right now is modeling not just 
you know, a structure and how it responds to sunlight, for instance, but can you model a single cell and how that goes into a colony of cells and how that colony of cells could grow into a living material? So there's many different scales you can look at. Um, there's different sorts of, you know, you can use Rhino, Grasshopper, you can just start writing things in Python. There's a lot of different ways to go about it, but at the end of the day, I think every time we're in a meeting, we always have paper and pens yeah. because that gets everything across fastest. Well, you know, I think the digital technology, that the paper and pen is a more collaborative tool, making physical models. That's a way in which everyone at the table can actually draw something. Whereas a computer is scaleless, it's, uh, you know, it's one person, and so there, there are strengths to both. Um, the motto of MIT is mens et manus, mind and hand. And there is something really important about discovering through that relationship between manipulation and cr practice and thinking mm -hmm. um, that's very generative. Mm -hmm. And I don't see really, I, I didn't grow up in with computers. I didn't, it wasn't until I was well into my career that uh, I began working with digital, with the digital. And I still, you know, mainly I imagine things and I work with my research assistants who actually implement, know how to implement them, but um, but I do use, I do do photography and I do use Photoshop and it's, uh, it's extraordinary the things that you can do with the digital. And so I, I echo my co-panelists here and it, it, it all depends and we are just so lucky to have that range of things uh, to work with from the digital to the pencil. Um, but also it's, you know, the digital involves uh, the hand too. Well, it's, not, it's not without <laughs> craft. It's not without craft, the digital craft. <laughs> and with that, we will call it a night. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you to our fantastic panelists for a fantastic conversation. Thank you.